The advantage of being a preacher, you can take your mask off. You can. <laughs> Good morning, church. What a blessing to be with you, to worship the Lord together with you. Uh, I, what, a, what a blessing. What a blessing. It's a tremendous uh, privilege. <clears throat> my name is Johan. Normally we stick with that because my last name is van der Westezen, and that's a bit more complicated for a lot of people, unless you Dutch uh, or Afrikaans. Uh, I'm originally from South Africa, but from Dutch descent on my dad's side. It's nice. Uh, I appreciate that my wife Stephanie is with me, can accompany me as well. And, uh, you know, so many times the preacher is the one up front and you don't realize the strength that the wife is that's behind him that enables this great part of the testimony that he has just to be in the ministry and do what God has called him to do and uh, certainly my wife fulfills that and I want to recognize that and she realizes, and it's very interesting I am involved with coaching church planters uh, by the way I algunas personas fuera de mi esposa que pueden entender lo que estoy diciendo en este momento and I'm not speaking in tongues <laughs> I've got these lights out here. Okay, there's not too many Spanish-speaking people. Okay, just checking out. Okay. We, uh, we're from South Africa, but we've been since 1985 in Chile in South America, involved with church planting there and training national leaders. And we are now involved with, uh, if you know, City to City, uh, you know, Redeemer, uh, City to City in New York, uh, with Tim Keller. They moved worldwide, really, but the Latin American branch, uh, since you can speak Spanish, you have to if you live for 34 years in a country, you know, you have to speak the language. So we have, uh, uh, we are training and we, uh, new coaches, new people coming in because they have found that a big chunk, and I just forget the percentages at the moment, of the failures that they've had in church planting is because the, of pressures from the wife and the family that couldn't cope with ministry pressures and didn't know. So they've developed a ministry just for the wives of those ministers that are, uh, they call it Paracaleo, and Stephanie is one of the trainee, trainers and coaches with just working with women that's in ministry as well. So. Uh, we, the Lord has blessed us in being together, and uh, I want to mention that because you see me standing up front, but really that's both of us <laughs> we, that's standing here. So we greet you in the name of the Lord. The Lord lives. He's risen, and He wants to speak to us through His Word today. So uh, the Lord be with you. And... Let's dive into the word and see what we are, what the Lord wants to say to us. This is a very interesting passage of scripture because um, in a way it's a, if you look just at the chunk of the word that there is here, we have a, a rather negative Scripture, because knowing what we know, we know Jesus is Lord. He came to save. He came to uh, rescue us. He came to seek us. And uh, so this is in the process. He still hasn't died and risen yet. But uh, the gospel gives us, the gospels give us the story of his life uh, and, and his development. Now, we've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the Gospels. Those are the four Gospels, and I know you would have been given an, an introduction to all of this. Uh, but I want to, if we don't understand the context within which this passage comes, we can go into a lot of pretext. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, scripture taken out of context is pretext. That's um, what we've been taught, and uh, it's good to know that. So, uh, now, John, the book of John, the gospel of John, the purpose is uh, in John, in chapter 20, verses 30 to 31, where it's, John now really says, look, I am going to write a lot of things, but this is specifically what he says, and I want to introduce this because this is important for us to remember. Otherwise, we're going to have difficulty with the text that we're going to deal with. Now, Jesus did many signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. In other words, Jesus said and did a whole lot more than what I'm writing. But these are written. These things that are write in this gospel, that's in this letter. But these that are written, uh, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you have life in His name. Hallelujah. I, uh, <laughs> this is why He writes. So we read a scripture and it's like, yeah, 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 the Jews, yeah, they just objecting to Him. They get, John says, I'm writing this so that you can believe in him. This is not just a good old scroll from the history that's been found under the stone. This is the living word of God, inspired by the Holy Spirit, brought to us today, 31st of October, 2021. Now, today is Reformation Sunday. Can you believe it? <laughs> 31st of October, it's a good day to be preaching on. You know what happened on 31st of October? You know, 1517. That is a bit, a bit before yesterday, huh? <laughs> Martin Luther went up and he nailed the 95 theses, or the 30, 95 suppositions that he believed to hold the true to scriptures challenging the religious institution of the day. And that was counted as he was not really the first one to speak against the religious authorities. There were others like John Huss that went before him. But uh, 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 this was taken as the event that sparked the flame, that made the difference, uh, that started uh, bringing the church bringing believers back round to the gospel, to believing in Jesus Christ. And there's a big split in the church uh, between the Roman Catholics and Protestant churches. So it was the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, had that not taken place, had everything uh, just gone the way it is, when the offering plate came by this morning, you would have dropped piles of money in. Because you had to buy your salvation. You would not be reading the Bible. Because that's only trained people that is able to read it. I'm glad that there are people who love the Lord. And we've got it in our language. And many different versions even, to try and capture the original text. So we have the Word of God. Aren't we privileged? <laughs> Aren't we blessed? So John writes this thing. So when we come to our text, remember, this is written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. And if you believe that, you'll have life. Not my words. Boom. Okay? Are you with me? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Good. I love it. You know, there's the African roots of me just kicking in. I love it. You say, man, I can say something. And I know, you know, you're with me. And he's like, whoo. Yeah. God is good. Yeah. Okay. So we have this. 
So many things not written. Okay, so what we have here is, uh, is written is so that we have sufficient to believe in. When you become a Christian, you do not kiss your brains goodbye. We don't say, you know, leave your brains outside the church. Just come in and have a good time with you. We say, come in and have a good time because God is with us. You understand what you're doing. You willingly follow him. He is your Lord. He is your Savior. He deserves the glory. And woo, man, I'm privileged. I forget I'm Presbyterian, you know, when I'm supposed to get. <clears throat> you know, I'm sorry, you know, for many Presbyterians, you know, the way we really say, woo, in Africa, it, you know, many uh, Presbyterians say, that is a good point he's making. <laughs> God loves us all, isn't there? <laughs> so many of you, that, so that you may believe. So I trust that your faith is built up this morning. As we read this, as we go into this, that you will see. Uh, and, 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 and just let the word minister to you afresh. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. So my prayer is... This morning, you hear the words of God, the words of the Spirit, and apply it to your life as you need it. All of us are in different positions, different walks of life, different stages of growth. It doesn't matter. He is God. He knows what your needs are, and He will minister to you so that you can believe in Him, and in believing, have eternal life. So, in verse 30, just the verse before the text, just to get it in, remember, this is written for you to believe. But now, in this stage, Jesus was, had a mixed crowd in front of him, okay? Because it says, when Jesus was teaching these things, there were many that believed in him. So, there's some that believed and it's obvious from the text that we have read, there are some who don't believe. Now, somebody asked me once as a pastor, how can I know that I'm a disciple? How can I know that I'm a Christian? And I think that's a very good question. I think it is something that each of us need to ask. Because we cannot just accept that the Christian life is saying a prayer. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Woo, I've said a prayer and I carry on living like the devil. Each of us, no matter where we are at, have to ask, what does a disciple of Jesus do where I am at? If it's not, Christianity is just going to become a dead, heavy, legalistic religion for you. I've got to read my Bible every day. I've got to go to church. I've got to go to the prayer meeting. I've got to go to the Bible. I've got to go. And everything you feel, you've just got to. You've got to. Something's amiss there. Something is not right. And so we find just because there's a crowd doesn't mean everybody is a Christian. <laughs> and this is how the truth comes out here. So Jesus said to those who believed him. Okay, so now Jesus is targeting those who have said, wow, yeah, you know, I believe he is the Messiah. What does he say to them? If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples believing in Christ brings salvation in other words another way of putting it as John put it as we read in the introduction it's giving it's life giving it's believing 
That's the first step of Christianity. Oh, yeah, Jesus died for my sins. He paid for me. I sh am the guilty one. I should have been the one on that cross. I deserve death, but Jesus paid it on my behalf. Wow. Yeah, man, I deserve not life, but he gave me, he gives me life. That believing in Christ is step number one. Because he's speaking to them, right? Step number one, I'm saved. But that is not just a one prayer solution. It's not just a one prayer life. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. That first step of believing in Jesus, John, in the first chap chapter, if you remember, verse 12, he said, But to all who receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Okay? So... I've heard all sorts of people say, oh, we're all children of God. Those in the church, at the church, I've heard Buddha say that, we're children of God. Yeah. Uh, in the sense that God is our creator and we are his children in the sense of just creation. But when you come to spiritual issues, spiritually speaking, it says, to those who believe in him, he gave the right to become children of God. So those are the ones. And that does not apply to everybody. It's to those who believe. So Jesus says here, abide in my word and you will truly it's a mark of a true disciple. So disciples are both learners and they are followers. Because the word abide, you know, I had a look into this. The Greek, is, it's quite a rich word. It's kind of quite a, to abide means to stay, to wait for, to remain, to keep on or continue. Uh, kind of capture all of that as best said, abide. So there's a, a stay, a waiting, a expectation, a remaining. And so uh, all of this, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. So the word is important and he gives us his word. And so many times I've just seen people and I have to question whether people are really Christians because they haven't read the Bible for three years. Somebody once said to me, well, you're the pastor. I believe you. I trust you. You read the scriptures and uh, I believe you. It's like, uh, something is wrong with that. You know? It's not just for the pastor to read the scriptures and to expose, expand the truth. It's for your life because it's for you where you are at in your growth with the Lord. It's a personal relationship with Him. So Jesus says, okay, if you abide in my word, and then he goes in verse 32, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So tell me, you know, I've heard this Christian life is so boring, you know. It's like as you abide, as you wait, as you challenge, and 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 we have to say, God. We don't have what it takes. You're too big. Give me your Holy Spirit so that I can understand you. And then let, I challenge you to test how that word, wow, I didn't know that was in the Bible. 
Oh, look at this. It's like, and so many times, it's like, okay, my, oh, Lord, what do I do? You know, this is three o'clock in the afternoon, and it's like, you know, just not being a together day I've had. Also, it's been a kind of off-color day for me. So what do I do? Think back to the time that you were in the Word in the morning. God may have preempted your situation. And so when difficulties come, when questions come, when obstacles come, it's so that God wants to teach us that we cannot make it on our own. It is as we abide in His Word, He ministers life. And say, whoa, this is what the Lord wants me to do. Yes, sir. It says, and you will know the truth. You will find the truth because the word of God. Now, remember way in the beginning? In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was? You people listen to when the pastor preaches. Congratulations. <laughs> So the word was God, and he gives us his word. So as we deal with the Bible, we deal with God. It's him expressing his heart for you. So the truth, therefore, is expressed in the word of God. So that's the one thing. But the amazing thing is as we... Abide in the living word, in, in the written word, we come across the living word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God. We meet him. So there's truth. You will know the truth. It's not just a written truth. It is the truth of Jesus Christ, the savior of the world. There's a relationship that gets formed. So Jesus is the only person in the whole universe who has said, I am the way, the and the Yahoo. Are you beginning to believe? You're getting John's drift? You will know as you abide, the Spirit will minister that truth. Wow. Joe Soap, John Nobody, Jesus loves you. He came for you. He loves you. No one comes to the Father but through me. Oh, you can go to Confucius, you can go to other religions, and they are all pointing to others. So, you know, lots of words of wisdom. If you believe this, this will be bad. And so you have the absurdity of people looking at a rock and say, Ooh, I feel the power. Ooh, here's it. And creation becomes the creator in their mind. Dumb idols that cannot speak. You're dealing with the living God to Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Abide in my word. You will find Jesus. So some of those boring passages, you know, I, I, I keep on saying, you know, it's for us in modern day, when you read through Leviticus and so on, it's like when you got insomnia and you cannot sleep at 3 o'clock in the morning, you want to read some of those passages to put you to sleep, you know. It's just so. Uh, <laughs> when you don't understand the purpose and you see oh, it's the truth that's given and you understand how God was concerned with his people, how he wanted them to live, what was his expectation. Wow, it takes on a whole new meaning. God did all of that? then you start getting an idea of the deep.
detailed, intimate concern He has for you. You will find truth. And that truth sets you free. So what does it set us free from? And here's where some opposition starts coming to Jesus, right? And you can see this is sparring. Okay, that was a good one. You can give life. Take this. And they try to throw questions at him to rattle him. The freedom from sin and condemnation. This is not just following your ideas, good examples. It's not just good words. It's not just doing what you think is right. That doesn't lead to freedom. Because I can, as a preacher, just stand here and say, okay, you need to pray more. Who of you have prayed sufficiently the way you ought to this past week? Come on, pray more. It's the end of my sermon. <laughs> oh, that's such a heavy load. Just kind of... Keep pointing all the things you ought to do, what you have fallen short on, what you should be improving. And it's like, oh, okay, I need to pray more. I need to go. And, and we do all sorts of things, but it comes out of our own strength. Remember the vine and the branches example that in John itself. Who bears the fruit? Can you see a branch? Oh, I've got to put on another grape here. Oh, it's going to work. What is oh, It's the vine that produces all the goods to give the fruit. It's not a strenuous thing. It's just being yourself in Christ. Because you've come and found the truth by abiding in Him, in His Word. Am I speaking English here? You understand me? Yeah. Yeah. So the gospel is the death, the burial, resurrection, the ascension of Jesus Christ on our behalf, on my behalf. Wow. So I'm free from guilt, the condemnation, and the dominance of sin. Freedom from the domination and the nature of sin and selfishness, which is one of the fruit of sin. The domination of that. Because the scripture, when you read it and you abide in the truth, you will find, it says, we can't say no to sin. You try and do that in your own strength. We need to depend on the Holy Spirit. Abiding in the truth. So we come to verse 33. Now these are the guys now that are in the religious congregation, but they have a lot to say. We are offspring, and I'm reading from the uh, English Standard Version here. We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say, you will be free? Now, can you always capture the sense of the pride that's in these verses? I always say that uh, people have a bad Christology because they have a bad anthropology. You know what anthropology is? The study of man. Okay? Who is man? What is person? So when you got that all mixed up, you will have your Christology, which is the study of Christ, who He is and His work. You'll have that all mixed up. Because if you see yourself as Superman or Superwoman, you have a very, you only need a small God just to fill in the gaps where you have not done anything. When you really see yourself as that tax collector that just stood with a Pharisee where he said, Lord, I thank you, I'm not like this guy. I pay my taxes, I go to church, I do all my good, you know, blah, 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 and he starts listing. And Jesus 
<laughs> what did the tax collector do? Lord, forgive me. And that man went home justified before the Pharisee. So it's not your works. It's the works of Christ. And the bigger your errors and sins, the more you realize the bigger the cross needs to be in your life. And that is what the truth is that's applied to your life. So it's not boasting in the flesh, which as these people, we are the offspring of Abraham. They were very quick to kind of trigger their lineage because this is now Israel, remember? So yes, physically, genealogically, they are offspring of Abraham. But I find it rather amusing that they say, we've never been enslaved to anybody. History teaches that Israel has been enslaved by Egypt, by Assyria, by Babylon, by Greece, by Syria. And by the time they were talking, they were, sub they were under Roman rule. He going to say, we've done nothing, you know, we're free. And how many people, they are enslaved to lasciviousness, to drugs maybe, to alcohol maybe, but in their hearts they are far from God. They turn and they say, I am free. Yeah, you're free to talk nonsense, you know, that's... <laughs> And, and this is where the boasting of the flesh, that self-centeredness is a root of sin. We always think ourselves better than what we are. So, come on, get a grip. When we have a time on confession, do you just say, confession finish? Or is it, oh man, Lord, yeah. This is where I'm at. So Jesus then he says, yeah, he turns it from the physical. Yeah, the guys didn't get this, all right? So they're talking about bondage. We get verses 34 to 36. Jesus turns a conversation directly and he addresses the issue of sin. And he answered them, truly, truly. Now this is... When you hear those words, or in the version that was read, verily, verily, uh, it's like, listen up, buddy, this is the bottom line. I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. You don't think of yourself as a slave, do you? So while we boast that we got freedom, while we boast that we can do a lot of things, we have, we see here, everyone who practices sin. That is within the nature of a sinner to do. So you can't just go and say, oops, I made a mistake. It's a lot of mistakes. Or a lot of, whoops. You know, that's, and we tend to downplay our sin. And we forget it's within the nature of a sinner to sin. That's what he does. He cannot do anything else. So that's why scripture says flesh cannot help our salvation. We do nothing. It's by faith in Christ. In the truth that he makes us grow. And to, that he saves us. So everyone who practices is a slave of sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So here's the concept. And, and it's difficult again for us. Uh, and, and I realize uh, many people come from slavery tradition. Or, and they may capture it. But here it is really in extreme situations. 
the slavery at this time of Jesus and at the Roman times, you, if the master set you free, nobody can make you do anything because the master has set you free. So if you are a slave to sin, sin is your idol. And that's the reason why we sin. We like it too much. So what is that habit you can't break? What is that thing that you cannot face and, and, and conquer? That's the real you. It's within the nature when you're without Christ. But when we abide in the truth, he gives us his spirit. And we can say no. And by his spirit, we get victory because we have his life in us. That is the truth of Christ. And so therefore, if the Son set you free, you are free indeed. Sin can come snapping at your ankles. But he is just a dog chained to a tree. He can only come so far. He can only do so much. Your soul will never be touched. Because you have passed from death to life. Sin is a slave master. And it's an idol. It will charge you. You realize that? It will cost you. It will cost you money. It will demand your money. It will demand your time. It will demand your energy. Depending on the nature of it, it will demand your family. It will, you will be out and miserable by yourself when, if Satan has his way with you. And all of that proclaiming, we've got freedom. Like the people, we are free. <laughs> we've just have a history of enslavement. So they may have referred just to the inner, well, yeah, we may be enslaved, but inside we are not slaves. We are free. So what are you saying? We child, we children of Abraham. It's very interesting. Jesus says in verse 37, I know that you are the offspring of Abraham. Yet you seek to kill me because my words find no place in you. Ouch. What a sad testimony. Children of Israel, these are people that have been circumcised. These are people who know the scriptures. These are people who know so many laws and go do their utmost best. My words have no place in you. They've not abided in the truth. The truth could not penetrate their soul. So, yeah, offspring. And, and so the words come to mind. I speak from what I have seen with my father and you do what you've heard from your father. And here we go in the questions of two fathers here. And I won't go into this. I'm going to actually end the sermon a bit shorter of the text of actually than 41. We'll pick it up because to me this brings it to a logical conclusion just for today. But the words come to mind from Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 to 23. Not, any, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And cast out demons in your name? And do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. 
as I said, this is a rather negative passage, right? <laughs> but what a fearful thing to say. Surely, I mean, driving out, I mean, we're talking big words here, right? These would be guys with major ministries. Just be able to drive out demons and uh, prophesy and do mighty works. And man, this is upfront big stuff. The Lord looks on the heart. What does he see there? He says, you workers of lawlessness. In other words, you aren't in my words. You aren't in my truth. You aren't abiding. You're not even expecting. You're just going ahead and doing your own thing. And when you do your own thing, it's Christ labels it as lawlessness. How hard is that? On contrast, remember the parable of the talents. When the master came and found those who have been, the, the servants who have been faithful with five talents and two talents, he says it to both of them, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. So which words do you want to hear? Enter into the joy of your master or I never knew you. What is the difference? Working for your own glory. So the question to the person who asked me, am I truly a disciple? Whose glory are you living for? <laughs> Notice, it's not the amount, it's not the big stuff. It's just the little faithful stuff. You will know the truth. And the truth shall set you yes because if the son has made you free not the devil not the sin not temptation not the baddies not the anybody can get you because you are free indeed may Jesus get the glory because he has already provided the victory for you abide in his truth and you will so prove to be a true disciple.